Dear God, I really want to thank you um, for all the things you do every day uh, to help us solve our problems, large and small. Please open our eyes to see how much you're always working in our life, um, how blessed we are, how protected we are. Um, thank you also that um, we have this church where we can join together to worship you and sometimes to study the Bible. We pray that the time we spend here on Tuesday night is not wasted, but is blessed by you so that despite everything, you can use it to teach us things that we need to know and to make us grow up as Christians. Please be the person uh, always who's here teaching us, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And please, I hope that neither I nor anyone will stand between you and your people in the word that you're speaking to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, last week we read verses 37 through 54 of chapter 11, all of which has to do with the woes to the Pharisees and the lawyers. But we only finished discussing the Pharisee part. That is, we our discussion kind of finished around verse 44. So tonight... I plan to finish discussing verses 45 through 54, which is the part that where Jesus is speaking primarily against lawyers. Remember where we are, please, in the sort of overall large structure of the, the gospel. Um, in the early three or four chapters, we learned a lot about Jesus and then in his ministry in Galilee, we learned a lot about Jesus and his disciples and how the world reacts to them, including both the natural world, all the people that they encounter, and even the supernatural world, the, the devil and the demons. Now we're on the road to Jerusalem. This is the large bunch of text in, in, uh, in Luke, about 10 chapters where Jesus and his disciples have turned themselves outside of Galilee and are now moving sort of towards Jerusalem. And of course in Jerusalem, that's when the very difficult work that Jesus will do on the cross will happen, but all of that's still in the future. So right now we're with Jesus and his disciples moving down the road towards Jerusalem. As they go, especially there in the beginning of their Jerusalem Road, we saw the range of reaction that Jesus can sometimes receive from different people in different places. The men and women who are actually truly following Jesus that started with them in Galilee and will stay with them until Jerusalem and even beyond into the, to the church era, those are his disciples, people who Persist in following Jesus are by definition the disciples of, of Jesus. And the life of disciples is not easy, but it's, it's worth it because it's an eternal life. It's a blessed life which has already begun actually, though it may pass through some difficulty along the way. The, the disciples are eternally okay because their name is written in the book of heaven, Jesus says. But not everybody or even very many of the people that are talked about uh, at this point in Luke's gospel, our disciples, the disciples are still a relatively small, small group of people. There's huge crowds of people following Jesus with a wide variety of interests, including people who will become disciples and are genuinely attracted to, to Jesus and his, his teaching on the one end. And on the other hand, religious leaders of the day who are already plotting to try to catch him and kill him and, and everything in between. There's all different kinds of reasons why people are following Jesus and either rejecting him sometimes or accepting him with wild enthusiasm sometimes. But one of the ideas we do get in chapters 9 and 10 is that responding in an accepting way of Jesus is really important because on the other hand, rejecting Jesus seems to be a very dangerous thing. Jesus says some of the scariest things in the Bible, woe to the unrepentant cities. He's looking out to Judgment Day or to the end of time when those who have been given a chance to accept him but have refused to accept him face some kind of difficult time near, near the end. And so 
already that theme has been introduced that accepting Jesus is important uh, for your, you know, your eternal life. And the other thing that we, we pick up here, and it's the last on this outline, and Jesus seemed pleased by this, that the people who seem to accept Jesus are not the wise people or the learned people or the rich people or the powerful people. On the contrary, it seems that the people who, are, who God is revealing his son to and, and who are accepting him and becoming his disciples are rather simple people, not, not usually very well educated, not even usually very holy or pious or religious, just simple, normal, common people to whom it pleases God to reveal his, his son and to, to, to draw them to, to him. So as Jesus and his disciples keep moving on the road to Jerusalem, it gives a, a, a lot of opportunity for teaching. And um, Jesus teaches sometimes his disciples, sometimes the crowds, sometimes a mixture of his disciples in the crowd, and sometimes it's a little hard to tell how, how big the audience is that he's, that he's teaching. The teachings that Luke records here of Jesus, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the story of Martha and Mary, how to pray the Lord's Prayer, why the casting out of demons by Jesus is evidence of the coming of the kingdom and not that Jesus is somehow in league with, with the devil, what it truly means to be blessed, how it's not usually good to ask for a sign that Jesus already has provided a sign and more than enough sign of who he is and so no further sign will be given. Every one of these lessons was important to the people Jesus was talking to but continues to be relevant to us t today. I think, I think uh, it's fair to say every one of these lessons could easily be a whole sermon by a pastor in a church. Some of them could be two sermons or three sermons. These are important, important teachings of of Jesus. And, and therefore, really, we can't do justice to these when we review, but I just noticed the, the teaching that we've passed by because with one final teaching there in chapter 11 about seeing the light of Jesus and then being filled with the light of Jesus so that we can become, in turn, the light of Jesus in, in the world, <coughs> that's at the point at which Jesus' teaching was somehow interrupted by this Pharisee who invited Jesus for lunch. And the lesson that we started reading and discussing last week and that we finished tonight all takes place, you know, at lunch in the house of the Pharisee um, after Jesus' teaching has sort of been interrupted for, for lunchtime. And he's gone to this place where there's some Pharisees and some lawyers. And we see Jesus um, using that as an opportunity to teach another important lesson um, about the scribes and the Pharisees. Basically, he is lamenting the condition of the most religious people in his day. The, the Pharisees set the standard for the whole nation for how religious people should be in their daily life and behavior. The lawyers are the ones who pour through scripture and who debate and argue and add clarifying laws and sort of flesh out the, the scripture so that it becomes larger and more complicated. And they sort of work together because the lawyers are building the legal base that the Pharisees are obeying. And between them, they constitute sort of the, the, the flower of the Old Testament law and prophet. This is what it looks like in Jesus' day in, in the persons of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so they've interrupted Jesus' teaching uh, to invite him over. And then Jesus is going to use this as a chance to teach something that, that we need to understand. So I, I'm not going to ask Steve to reread the whole reading from last, last week. We won't reread re the part that we've already d discussed. But here's a picture of Jesus reclining at table, sitting at the lunch table with the Pharisees who have invited him, him over for, for, for lunch. And I, what I'm going to do, though, to warm up to tonight's reading is to just quickly skim past the text that we studied last week just remind you like what, what happened next and what happened next. And as I go, if you have any comment or question left over from last week or new tonight, please just throw up your hand because I think tonight we have time to stop and, and talk, talk about some, some stuff. The one thing I wanted to say before I do that, and it, this, again, is something that just occurred to me on the train coming over here. I don't know why I have these ideas always in the train coming over here. But if you look at this picture, 
You have Jesus who is the Word of God. He's, he's the summary of the law and the prophets. He's everything in Scripture, the, the, the Word that God has sent to, to man since the beginning of time until that time and, and beyond. That's Jesus. And we've been hearing Jesus teach to the, to the people. On the other side are the Pharisees and the scribes, and they are the ones who in Jesus' day have the greatest claim to being, to having properly received the word of God through the prophets and through the law and interpreted it and applied it into life. And now they're setting the standard for the nation of Israel to take God's word their way. And so we have the, the true, perfect, eternal standard, Jesus on the one hand, and the state of religion in Israel represented in the scribes and Pharisees on the other hand, side by side. And if, <coughs> if the scribes and the Pharisees had gotten it right, if they'd understood what the prophets said, if they'd understood what the laws of Moses meant, if they properly interpreted these and applied these, and then if the Pharisees had properly obeyed these and taught others to obey these, when Jesus came, they would have recognized him instantly. They would have accepted him completely. And so that's not what happened. So what we can see is that Jesus, when he finally comes to summarize everything, the whole voice of God to, to the nation of Israel, when Jesus comes to fulfill it all, He's not recognized by these people, which means that they've really lost the plot uh, uh, on, in, in terms of, of reading, understanding, and living the, 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 the Word of God. There's hardly any other way you can read this as, as a Christian anyway. So that's what's going on here. We've got Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees contrasted and compared through a long bunch of texts. Last week we read the part about the... Pharisees, tonight we're going to read the part about the lawyers. But let me just quickly run past the part we, we read last week about the, the Pharisees. So you, you remember that Jesus is there at lunch, and they were expecting Jesus to do a sort of ceremonial hand washing, just like this little boy. This is a picture of a modern day Jewish school somewhere. <clears throat> it's a well established principle in, in, the, in Jewish writing, outside the Bible, by the way, but that before you will eat, you'll pour a certain amount of water over your hands, not for, for hygienic reasons, but as, as a symbol of purification, the same way a priest would do before he offered a sacrifice to, to God. It's just a reminder that we live in a sinful world and we need to purify ourselves. And I, I, I suppose nothing so wrong about that, that custom um, in many times and places. But Jesus didn't do that. That's how the story begins. And he gets a reaction from the Pharisees who are astonished that he doesn't do that. And you have to ask yourself whether in a normal circumstance Jesus might have just been polite and washed his hands the way they were expecting so as not to cause trouble to his hosts. I, th I sort of think so. I think Jesus is making, taking an opportunity to teach a lesson here by not doing that. But it may also be true that inventing ceremonies that really weren't in the Bible and making them centrally important to your religious life is bad enough that Jesus just doesn't do them because there shouldn't be invented ceremonies and, and he's also teaching that lesson. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, Jesus doesn't wash his, his hands on this occasion and he gets a, a surprised reaction. And so then Jesus uses it as an excuse to teach not about hand washing but about cleanliness in general. He's saying, you guys are good at the outside things, washing cups and dishes on the outside, or any other things, you know, all of the ceremonies that they have are all about what you can see. Ritual purity as you can see by your eyes, what they do. But, but Jesus is saying that it's what's inside which is more important, and inside you guys are filled with greed and, and, and wickedness, he, he says to the, to the Pharisees. Uh, he, this whole teaching basically will, will revolve around the thought that inward spiritual purity is more important than external, physical, symbolic um, purity. And that if you really love God and if you really cared about what God taught through the prophets and the law over all these centuries in the past, then you would care most about your internal state 
and least about the external things. But these guys have everything upside, upside down <coughs> to oversimplify a little bit. They're worried about what's on the outside and they're ignoring what's on the inside. <coughs> and to get their attention and to make sure they understand that this is a theological point having to do with their attitude towards God. It's just not a, a trivial matter of, of, of hand washing or cup washing. He's saying, you fools, don't you know that the one who made the outside, the cups and the dishes and tithing and washing of hands and all the stuff that you guys build your whole religious practice around, the same God who did all of that outside stuff is also the same God that made you in the heart internally, that, that, he, that he sees that as well. And so it's also true, I think, that the point shines too, that God cares much more about, in fact, only about, we might say, what's inside and not what's outside. And so if they understood that, they wouldn't behave the way they are. The fact they are behaving the way they are, putting so much attention and priority on how their, their external religion is perceived, means that they do forget God. They're the people who are supposed to represent God, and, but they're just forgetting about God completely because they've been lost in the external things. And they're foolishly forgetting that God made them internally, spiritually also. And, that, and that's, that's why he says, woe to you, you fools. Jesus is sorry to see how low they, 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 they are in the things of heaven, in the things of, of, of spirit. And so then they may be thinking, and, and the ones who are really hearing Jesus should be thinking, oh my gosh, that's right. I, I, what should I do to be sure that I really am inwardly clean the way God cares about rather than all these rules that I've been learning how to follow? And Jesus gives them a hint here, and he says, well, what you can do is, is you can give to the poor. This is an oversimplification, but, but a huge part of the Old Testament teaching was teaching that, we, that the people who have wealth should share with the poor, should share with the foreigner, should share with the widow, should share with the orphan. Old Testament prophetic voice was very much concerned with leaving the edges of your, your fields you know, unplowed and not harvesting all of the fruit from your orchard. The whole deal in the Old Testament was basically making sure that people had enough to eat. And yet the, the Pharisees are living in a, in a place where evidently there's a lot of poor people who don't have enough to eat. And they have an easy way to set their conscience at ease about the difference between internal and external. And that's give, give, to, the, give to the poor, sincerely, lovingly give to the poor. Is it that they don't give anything? Are they just stingy? Jesus says, no. You guys are very ostentatious in your giving. He, he said, woe to you because you take mint and rue and every herb and you carefully count out one-tenth of the seeds or one-tenth of the whatever, you know, so that you can make your tithe to, to the temple or, or to the synagogue or wherever they, they tithe to on all of this little stuff. And I think I, I'm right in saying Jesus is using this as an example of just absurd and extreme attention to detail in, in view of the fact that they're neglecting the most important things. Now, Jesus doesn't say that this is bad. He says, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. But Jesus is saying, woe to you and you fools, that you take so much time to count out a tithe of all this little stuff, which really doesn't matter. And it probably doesn't cost you much anyway. I mean, even if you accidentally gave 20% of your, of your mint, you know, you probably wouldn't die. You know, you just would have less mint. But <coughs> what they should be doing is paying attention to social justice and the love of God, which means they'd be already digging deep into their pocket for poor people. And, and they'd be motivated by the fullness of their love for God, which means they wouldn't even be thinking about tithing anymore because they would be just giving, you know, from the fullness of love and the Holy Spirit in all kinds of ways, you know, rather than having rules that they have to follow that sort of limit their generosity. And finally, he says to the Pharisees, you guys like to be popular. Um, he says, you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. And I just I found some stupid cartoon of some church guy who's planted his flag, you know, in the, in the front right row of the, of, of the church because he wants people to see him every week when he comes to church. Oh, you're in church and you're, 
you're doing lots of holy stuff. You know, that's that's great. And that's Jesus has that against the, the Pharisees also, that they they like it too much. You know, the, they've made a, a game and uh, out of their religiosity, and they've also made it the way that they self-actualize and, and, and their, their self-worth, you know, comes from how people perceive them um, being, a, a, being a Pharisee. And then the final thing, and this is kind of the summary of last week, I think, is Jesus says that, you know, you take all of this together, you, you Pharisees, woe to you, because as far as Jesus is concerned, they're like an unmarked grave. And the meaning, as we discussed last week, is that, you know, in, in, they're so intent on being pure and everything. Dead bodies, in a ritual sense, are, are very unclean. So Jews <coughs> would have been careful not to bury bones someplace where people walk because if you did that then people would accidentally walk over the the you know unmarked graves and and they'd be un impure ceremonially and impure and not even know it and so jesus is telling them you're like that you're you're you actually contaminate the people they're, they think that they're the example for the people and and maybe most of the people think so too but in fact they're contaminating the people in all the ways that, that's been talked about here um, through, through their sort of hip, hypocritical approach to God and, and religion. And so you, you make people unclean by just associating with them, but you're dangerous because you're, you're dressed up in this, in this vision of purity. So people don't even notice how, how contaminated it is for them to be around you. Later, at the, in the beginning of the next chapter, the first couple of verses, Jesus will say to his disciples, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is their hypocrisy. And Jesus, I'm pretty sure, is saying, if you guys, you Christians, aren't careful, these guys are going to come into the Christian church, either by conversion or you Christians, you followers of mine, you disciples, are going to be just like them on Christian soil. You've got to be aware of that, because once you have people like this inside your church, it spoils everything. So I mean, the, the Pharisees have, have been inside Israel now long enough that the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees has gone everywhere. It's, it's throughout society in Israel and it's ruined because of them. And Jesus doesn't want the same thing to happen to Christians. So not only is he teaching a lesson for his time, but he's teaching a lesson for our time also. And the, the Pharisees in that they exist as a as a warning to especially probably evangelical Christians and, and other people who can very easily fall into the habit of thinking that they're an example for everybody, how we're so religious and we go to church and we do all this stuff, you know, but it can quite easily become that, what it was for the Pharisees, and that would be, that would be bad. So we don't want to be like that, and Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you guys shouldn't be like this. You know, it's, it's dangerous for you. Woe to you. So that's what we covered last week. And then the lawyers show up. And this is um, a picture of a lawyer in the sense of the... <coughs> this is a picture supposedly of what Gamaliel, Paul's teacher, would have looked like based on what we know about the kind of clothes they wore in Jesus' day. So I didn't want you to think the lawyers had like a suit and tie and a briefcase or something like that. But they're more, they look more like, like that. And, and their job is to be experts, though, on the, on the law, to, to read the law, to interpret the law, to develop the law, to expand the law, to help people use the law, to apply the law. And that's where the Pharisees go at, for, for the legal basis for all of the stuff that they, they do and they think is important. So Pharisees and scribes kind of go together. And many of the um, lawyers are also Pharisees, but not all. That's just background information. There are lawyers who are not Pharisees, too. So, Steve, um, what I want to do is just to reread this part from 45 to 54. Ken, is his microphone turned way up again? Last week we were okay. He, you came through like a, a beacon in the night. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, emote. Here we go. Okay, thank you. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, 
for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. So the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Okay, so, thank you. And keep in your mind the face of this stern gentleman as we, as we go on. So, evidently this group of... Um, where Jesus is eating, the Pharisee invited Jesus to his to his house. But if, if you look at it, it says one of the lawyers means there's multiple lawyers there in the same house where they're eating lunch with the with the Pharisees. So evidently, uh, the you know there were several lawyers included in the group who were eating there and who have just heard Jesus teaching against the uh, the, the Pharisees. Some of all some some are all of the people who are Pharisees whom Jesus was expressly teaching against might have been lawyers but not necessarily all <coughs> this guy the way he answers he says one of the lawyers answered him teacher in saying these things you insult us also suggests a few things one, one it suggests that he thought during that long harangue by Jesus maybe Jesus wasn't really talking to him <laughs> Um, be, because now the point is raised that I guess you're also insulting us as if it weren't obvious from the beginning. So he thought at least that he was separated from some of that criticism at least until he made this, this comment and now he's brought up the point, well, you know, come to think of it, you're insulting us also, which means at some point in the conversation he didn't think so. It's possible that he is a lawyer that's not a Pharisee and so that's the sense behind his comment, he was thinking that by not being a Pharisee and, and just a lawyer that he, he would be okay. But, but now that he starts thinking about Jesus' teaching, he's realizing that Jesus' criticism cuts lawyers as well. Or he could be a Pharisee and a lawyer both, but, but now he's just speaking you know, as a lawyer and, and, and saying, you know, well, yeah, there's some points you're making about the religious party of the Pharisees, but it seems to me that some of the cuts that you're making here are actually cutting into the very essence of being a, a, a scribe, of, of being a lawyer. That's, nobody knows quite you know, how, how you want to want to read that. Here when Luke says lawyer, it's the same thing as Matthew and other people when they say scribe. It's exactly the, the, same, the same thing. These were the guys who studied the law more than anybody else, who knew the law more than anybody else, therefore they taught the law to other people, they applied the law to life in Israel, they interpreted the law so that it could be, as they thought, more easily understood by people or made more applicable to practical daily life or adjusted as necessary to fit the circumstances of ordinary daily life and so forth and so on. They were the ones who lived in the law and lived by by the law and helped other people in, in the whole country with with the law. Law does not mean just what's in the Old Testament in the, in the Bible. <clears throat> it means that the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, it means the rest of what we call the, the Old Testament. Um, and, and it means, in addition, all of the writings of the sages that make up what's called the Mishnah and 
It will come eventually to include other writings and commentaries which make up Talmud. It's a large body of, of, of writings. I don't know physically how big you would say it is. And in fact, there are a lot of related commentaries and books just like in a Christian library. So you, you might understand that these, that these lawyers have a, a big body of written work that, that, that they, they try and, and, and master, not just the Bible. In fact, in the Mishnah it says that obeying the interpretations of the rabbis is more important than obeying the scripture itself because the scripture itself is often difficult to understand or, or to apply and that the work of the rabbis and the sages has been to make it more clear for people so that they know what's really required and they know what's really necessary. Um, which is interesting. It's to them. It's almost the work of the lawyers, <clears throat> and and this is the sort of the history of rabbinic Judaism. I mean, these guys in the, later will be the rabbis who teach, <clears throat> who teach. Often they'll call Jesus teacher or rabbi. It's the same sort of same sort of sort of guys here. Paul would would have been like this too. <clears throat> Barnabas would have been like this. There are a lot of New Testament characters who were well schooled in the. In, in the, the the law, not just the Old Testament law. Um, so he says here to Jesus, teacher, which means he's either addressing Jesus respectfully or ironically. Right? You you can't you can't be sure. He may be saying, teacher, you know, you think you're a teacher, but I'm a a, a lawyer. I know. Or he might really, you know, have taken on board that Jesus teaches with great authority everywhere, and and he wants. He actually respects him in a scholastic, you know, teaching sort of, sort of a, sort of a way. Um, he's, and then he says, "These things that you say insult us also, right? And insult lawyers as such, and insult lawyers in particular, and not just insofar as they may may or may not be Pharisees." And so you have to ask yourself, what is it that Jesus has said, which the lawyer finds insulting to lawyers? And nobody knows that nobody knows the the answer to that. But but one of the suggestions which had also occurred to me is Jesus talked about tithing, certain things that you you tithe, and and it, it may maybe that by talking about specific examples that would have been the subjects of specific detailed conversations among the lawyers, they feel that Jesus is sort of intruding on the the lawyers' territory because it's their job, specifically. But for example, when the Bible makes a statement without specifying quantities. One of the things that the lawyers do is to define the quantities that the scripture is applying to. You know, when you wash your hands, is it this much water, this much water, this much water? And if you really believe in following the Bible, but the Bible doesn't give you many details like that, you need lawyers to tell you that, right? And so these guys have a whole system of weights and measures and volumes and stuff so you can know how much, what, you know, how many, you know. And so Jesus was sort of touching on that in his examples. Jesus' teaching is completely internal and spiritual. But insofar as he was sort of disrespecting the, the external, particularistic kind of, you know, things, it may be that, that that's how Jesus insulted the, the lawyers. Um, and then, you, again, you have to ask yourself why he didn't think at first that that they were, Jesus was meaning to criticize lawyers. Um, do you have any thoughts of your own? Why, why it's surprising to a lawyer that Jesus actually is saying things that are critical of lawyers? Because he, he raises the issue here like, hey, you're attacking lawyers now, not just Pharisees. Why would a lawyer think that he's less likely to be criticized by Jesus than a Pharisee, do you think? I think it's a real question with a real answer. Well, I think that our lawyers at that time had a certain assumption that uh, because uh, because they are the defenders of the law, I mean, the, whether it's the Constitution or the I hate you, but we're like out of legalism, but the point is they are it's kind of like a, they are the defenders of your, I mean the God's law but the thing is it is not about you know, what God's law, it's about the law created by the human. Yeah. I, I think that they felt that 
because they were lawyers, there, there couldn't be anything Jesus could actually criticize, right? I mean, they had the law. That was where truth was rooted. And in their way of handling law, it was the discussions and debates among the lawyers which determined the applicable, you know, sections of law and how they were to be used. And so they literally believed that their determinations about how law should be applied were more important than the original text of the scripture sometimes. Um, and so he was surprised maybe that Jesus thought that he could wander off into a legal dispute about legally technical things, which is really supposed to be, the law isn't supposed to be um, debatable by Jesus, maybe. <coughs> okay, so then Jesus says, <laughs> I always think, I think this is funny. So Jesus says, well, woe to you lawyers also. <laughs> that's what I, that's how Steve did it. And I, I liked it last week, you know. The, he was saying, woe to you Pharisees. And the lawyers said, well, that's insulting the lawyers. And Jesus says, well, woe to you lawyers also, because I actually am intending to include you in my critique of, of religion in, in, in Israel. Why? Because you load people with burdens that are hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Right? So, I think this is obvious to everyone, but how is it that the lawyers load the people with burdens that are difficult to bear? How do lawyers do that? Okay, well, I mean, like in the European Union, there's like a thousand pages of regulation on cabbage or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you have a, when you have a, when you have a, 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 a government that makes rules, sometimes the burdens can become quite heavy. And that's, I think that's the, the basic mechanism. The burden means the number and complexity of the laws that people are expected to, to follow and obey keeps getting bigger and bigger all the time. So by this time, people said there was more than 600 laws and commandments that they, that they had to follow. There was, I forgot the number, 20 or something different work definitions that you can and can't do on the Sabbath. You know, the, the lawyers were trying to make the law. I mean, let's face it, the Bible is pretty general and vague in many places, right? When we studied Leviticus, we talked about the law. What does that mean? How would you apply that? You know, how would you do that? You know, that's a lot of stuff isn't clear. And these lawyers are going to fix that by making it clear. And in the process of making it clear, they're adding laws and they're adding laws and they're adding definitions and quantities and stuff until finally the burden of the law gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and finally, it's hard hard to bear. So the law is supposed to be the blessing of God to his chosen people. The benefit they have over all the people on the earth is God spoke to them, they have God's word, but the lawyers have turned it into a burden rather than it being a blessing as it was intended to be. He says, you yourselves do not touch these burdens with one finger. Well, it's hard to know, you know, what what he means. So one of the things it could mean is that the lawyers make laws, but they don't obey the laws themselves. So there are cases where that would be true, right, in, in history. But basically, that's probably not what's meant here, because these guys are b believed to be by themselves and by society at large as as the people who are keeping the laws, right? I mean, that's... Jesus is, is is accusing them, and it gets clear here in a little bit of, of hypocrisy. And sometimes that hypocrisy might take the form of they actually pass a law knowing that they're personally going to break it. That there may be that kind of example, but that may not be the main the main example. When they say they don't touch the burden with one of their fingers, it, it could mean more likely that because they are experts on the law. 
they know how not to be burdened by the law. That's actually true of lawyers in our time also. If, if you really do understand the law, you can just kind of adjust your life around it pretty easily compared to people who don't know the law and are always bumping into the law all the time, right? They, so they could actually be shaping the law in a way that makes sense to them, both as a legal structure for society, but also as, as a way they're going to live their own life. Just like people in Congress don't make laws that are bad for Congress, sort of, right? And lawyers might not, might not make laws that are bad for lawyers sometimes either. <coughs> But I think, you know, and, and I think the better commentators agree that what's meant here is you don't touch the burdens is a more serious spiritual theological point. The Old Testament law, like we studied when we studied the minor prophets in here, contains the gospel. The voice of God, if you're listening carefully, as you hear it in prophecy, is always saying, I love mercy more than sacrifice. Return to me and I'll return to you. I have always loved you. Repent of your sins and I'll bless you. God is always, not just when Jesus came, but always, God is always the voice of grace and reconciliation and love and long-suffering. And that's a big part of the law and the prophets that the teachers of the law should have been capturing somehow as they taught the normal people how to hear God's law and to obey it. But instead, they're picking up the hard bits the detailed, almost stupid regulations like how to tithe for mint or so something like that. I think Jesus at points is saying, come on, you know, this is, it's the internal spiritual things that God cares about, right? If they were really teaching the law properly, if they'd really heard the prophets correctly, they'd be teaching the gospel, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the Old Testament form of the gospel, not legalism of some sort that's almost impossible to, to do unless you're a professional lawyer. Right. So, in other words, this difference between the spirit of the law and the, the letter of the law. Ha has always been there, even in the Old Testament. Not just, it's not, it, it's, it's an it's a understandable mistake to say that the New Testament is compassionate and the Old Testament is harsh, but it is a mistake. It just means that you haven't been spending enough time with both Testaments long enough. But the same Jesus who's speaking here is in some sense the Jesus who was speaking in the prophecy of the Old Testament also. And so the, the, the religious leaders in Israel have missed the point. And they've created a law which is a burden to the people instead of a relief to the people, a, a joy to the people, a hope for the people. I think that's probably most likely the main thing Jesus has in his mind here is that you guys are supposed to be taking the word of God and helping people, but you're taking the word of God and burdening people. That's wrong, right? And again, that's a lesson that needs to come through to the modern church also, right? I mean, the, if you go to a church that just keeps making you feel bad by burdening you with, you know, stuff that you've got to do, and somehow is letting you miss the point of God's love, then that's, that's, your church is making a mistake, you know, and that happens in Christian territory, not just Jewish, I think. Although Christ really recentered religion quite effectively through what he did in Jerusalem, you know, soon. So anyhow, that's, that's Jesus' complaint to them is that they're, they're burdening people, they're not helping people, and that's not what you're supposed to do with the laws. And then he starts to say something which is really hard to, to be sure that I understand correctly. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna, I struggled with this after reading lots, and I may be wrong, but, so please you know, think for yourself and follow along my struggle to understand this. Jesus says, now he's saying woe again to the lawyers. And again, woe is not a curse. Woe is sad. Jesus is sad. He was sad the Pharisees are that way. He's sad the lawyers are this way. Because they're supposed to be carrying the word of God to the people, but they're not. He says, woe to you, presumably still talking to lawyers, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers kill. So first of all, you have to ask yourself, how are they building the tombs of, of, of the, the prophets? And... There is evidence from archaeology and from outside the Bible and maybe even a little bit inside the Bible that they were literally building monuments to David and Abraham and 
they, they were as they had the resources to do it. It's a the, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people, and so they knew their own history. They were proud of their own history. They would go and build tombs or, or monuments to the some of the famous prophets prophets uh, of, of old. You know, dead prophets. And remember. Except for John the Baptist, there hasn't been a prophet in Israel for nearly half a millennium. So the prophets they're remembering are way, way back there in history, 500 years before or 1,000 years before, you know. So, but they're remembering that, and they're actually building, you know, monuments to the to the to the prophets. Um, and then, um, so in that sense, they're building memorials to the to the prophets. Uh, of old who they're sort of revering or, or respecting but they wind up also in the same way building monuments to their fathers who killed the prophets you know as the bible teaches and shows throughout is that most of the prophets god sent to israel were abused and mistreated and, and a lot of them were, were were killed and so when you build a monument to a prophet saying isn't israel great Here's a monument to my prophet. What you're doing, if you realize it is, you're also memorializing the behavior of Israel, which was not very accepting of the prophets when they had them. They, they like dead prophets pretty much, but they never liked living prophets so much you know, because the living prophets were not controllable by legal interpretation. <laughs> right. And, and so... Um, you know, I, I, I think that they don't recognize and condemn the history of their fathers while they're memorializing the prophets that their fathers, their fathers killed. They, they should actually, as they build monuments to the prophets, recognize the religious failings of Israel, but they don't. And, and, and they sort of acquiesce to that or, or accept that. Um, so, you know, I think Jesus is saying, woe to you. You don't even realize the abundance of sin is Israel as you blithely build tombs to the prophets who your fathers killed. You know, the prophets aren't necessarily a good sign for your, you guys. A good sign for God. He sent his word. But the way Israel treated him wasn't a good sign for Israel. But they're building monuments about that, which means they're confused. I think. Before I go there, there's there's one other thing that people have thought, and I think too might be here is he's speaking specifically to lawyers. Remember, how do lawyers build things? You know, um, lawyers are not builders or politicians or monument builders, really. They might be causing that to happen, but there's another sense in which they could be building building tombs for the the prophets. And that would be with their words, with their teachings. The, the words of the prophets were bringing God's word to Israel pure. The, the lawyers are, are reading all of that stuff, debating it, interpreting it, and then they're developing these detailed rules that Jesus doesn't like because they constitute a burden to the people rather than a joy to the people. So some have thought Jesus is making a very subtle but, but strong point here that, that you know, they're... they're the tombs that they build to the prophets are actually the, the, the place where they're burying the words of the prophets also. So their fathers killed the bodies of the prophets, but the, but the lawyers are killing the teachings of the prophets by just putting them in a tomb of words that don't help the people any, anymore. And that, that thought could be here, could be here also. They've lost the thought that mercy is greater than sacrifice to Yahweh. And, and have made it all about sacrifice, you know, and, and, and symbol and external stuff. All right. So anyway, the lawyers condemn their fathers and themselves by preserving the memory of the prophets who their fathers killed, while killing the prophecies of the prophets through the piling on of laws and unhelpful teachings. So if you combine all of it between the old generations and the current generations, the, the, the religious people in Israel basically completely erased the prophets. God sent them. But, but it didn't work because one way or another they, they killed the prophets and then they ignored their teachings and so it's as if God hadn't blessed Israel with the prophets at all. But they still think they're special because they had the prophets so they're building monuments to it. 
that may be a fairly good description of, of, of Israel at some times and, and places. So then G Jesus c continues, and I think it's the same thought here that I've been saying before. Is he's saying, by keeping alive the memory of the history of the prophets, they're actually bearing witness to the guiltiness of their, of their fathers. They're remembering how Israel is, what Israel did to, to prophets. Yet they don't condemn the deeds of their fathers. Instead, they build monuments to the prophets and to their own history, and so they're basically consenting to, or at least not condemning the deeds of their father. They, they should be saying, woe is Israel, this dirty country that kills all the prophets, but that's not their attitude at all. They believe Abraham won't let any Jew to go, in, go into hell because they're Jewish, right? Even though they've killed all of the prophets that God ever sent them. So again, Jesus is, is saying, you know, you're a witness and you also consent to the deeds of your fathers because of your behavior. Even, even now. And what's more, and I don't know if that thought is here, is there, there are prophets and apostles even in the same generation that, that Jesus is talking to who the religious leaders in Israel are going to kill, including Jesus himself. They're not going to build a tomb for him, I guess. <clears throat> But he, he is the, the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, and they're going to do the same thing to Jesus that they did to all of the other prophets and priests and kings, you know, almost. All right, so then we get, we get in verse 49 this saying that says, Therefore, because, I guess because the situation is as described above in Israel, the historic situation, the current situation with the Pharisees and the, the scribes, because of that, the wisdom of God said that it was going to do so, do something. And wisdom of God, all capital, is, is treating this as uh, a person. It, it could be an anthropomorphism where you treat a thing like wisdom as if it were a person. And often in the Bible, that, that that's the case. And in Proverbs, a few places and elsewhere, we speak of wisdom as if it were a person, but really we're just talking about wisdom. Uh, wisdom of God, some people have said, is Jesus, because there are several places in the Bible where Jesus is called the wisdom of God, and in some sense he is the wisdom of God. But probably I think what's here is that it's God in his wisdom who has spoken through the, through the prophets. So it, be, because of the way things are, the, the spirit of prophecy, the Holy Spirit, God, the, the, who is infinitely wise, the wisdom of God coming out in the word of the prophets, has said, I'm going to send them prophets and I'm going to send them apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute. All right, And so God's prophetic voice says, at some time in the past, about some time in the future, because of the way things are, I'm going to send some prophets and I'm going to send some apostles. And I know in advance, before I send them, that they're going to kill and persecute some of them. Something God knew it, and he sent them, knowing that that's what would happen. <clears throat> and, he, and he did it did it for a, a reason. What I'm saying I understand is confusing, but I don't know how to make it less confusing. Depending on when in the past the voice of God said this about the future, and which future he was talking about, prophecy is tricky that way. The fulfillment of this wisdom of God, this saying about the sending of prophets and apostles, the fulfillment of it <coughs> could be seen even in some of the old prophets that their fathers killed. This could have been a resolution of God that's pretty ancient, and therefore we've already seen partial fulfillment of it in the Old Testament prophets, but we'll see continued fulfillment of it in the current generation with prophets and apostles. Or it could be just looking at the current generation of, of new prophets and, and apostles, and, and it could be God explaining through his prophets that I'm going to send some more prophets and apostles later. So we had now John after 450 years, Jesus, the ultimate you know, prophet, apostle, and everything. And there will be more prophets and apostles in the, in the New Testament still. And indeed many of them will be persecuted and killed. Right, so 
it, at least it means that there's no break in the pattern. I mean, it's been that way for the from the Old Testament Israelites. It's going to be that way for the New Testament ones as well. God did it with foreknowledge and purpose and intent, and he did it because he knew that they would be persecuted and killed, and there was some reason behind that, which Jesus is trying to explain to us, explain to us here. <coughs> and the purpose of it is, Jesus says, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. So he's, he's already talked about the bloody history of Israel and how they've handled the prophets. He said that the prophetic word, the spirit, the wisdom of God has purpose to continue that on into the, on into the, to the church age. He knows that they're going to be persecuted and killed. And the reason why he did it is because he wants all of that blood shed from the foundation of the world to be charged against this generation. In other words, the guilt of the lawyers he is talking to and, and maybe the Pharisees are hanging on in fear at what Jesus is, is saying to the lawyers. This, this guilt of misunderstanding God's word, of misapplying God's word, of burning the people with God's word, of not encouraging the people with God's word, of not teaching people properly and leading them into the kingdom, which was their job, and of killing the prophets that God sent to help, that that guilt is unbelievably big and bloody. The blood of all of that, all the people of God that God sent, is not just gone into the ground and been forgotten. It, it needs to be dealt with somehow. It needs to be avenged. It needs to be atoned for. It, 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 the, the scales need to be balanced because the scales of justice are radically out of whack now. All the people God sent to save them were killed and abused. And it can't stand. God still has something left he needs to do to make it right. And Jesus is saying, you know, saying this, which is pretty scary stuff that he's saying to, to these, these guys. Right? <clears throat> and so he, he makes it even plainer and he takes two examples from out of the the the, um, the the Old Testament he takes the first person to be killed Abel the son of Adam it's not clear why he why Abel would be counted as a prophet but Jesus is really just trying to pick two examples of God's people who were murdered in the broad sweep of Old Testament history. The first one he goes for is the first one there is, is Abel, the first man who was ever killed by another man. And then he goes, most people think this Zechariah he's talking to here is the last prophet who was actually killed in service to God. You can read about this in Second Chronicles, something or other, I have it, have it in my notes. Or other people think it might be the prophet Zechariah, but that's unlikely. But anyway, Jesus is just trying to say, when I said before, all the blood, I meant all the blood, from the earliest death I can think of, Abel, to the latest death you can read of in your Bible. All of the prophetic voice that you have in your Bible before me, all of it is, is going to be required of this generation. This guilt hasn't been resolved yet by, by, the, by the nation. The nation of Israel stands under the blood guilt of all these generations of prophets that were killed. And it's it's going to have to be it's going to have to be handled somehow. How? How do, how do you handle that guilt? Is there any mechanism in Old Testament law? You know, I mean, it, Jesus has presented these guys who think that they're super holy and that they're the ones who are going to teach everybody else, and he said, "You guys are guilty of all the blood of all the prophets that God ever sent to you." It's, 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 it's interesting, yeah. I mean, the, um, Jesus is saying the prophets were, were real, the prophets were important, the prophets knew the gospel, that the, pro the prophets could have saved you. You ignored the prophets, you killed the prophets, you persecuted the prophets, and 
God saw all of it, and it's all sitting here. The blood of all the prophets is just, you're drowning in it, and you guys are going to, you're going to have to, to do something with it. And so this is a, I guess I should say, just a huge unanswered, unanswered question at this point. Jesus is raising this, this prospect, and you won't be surprised that pretty soon we're going to read that these guys are looking for ways to kill Jesus because Jesus has put a point on it. Israel is just profoundly guilty of the blood of all the prophets and the current generation of teachers of the law who build monuments to the history of the prophets but, but really are no different than their fathers were and who bastardized the laws by misinterpreting them and everything. You know, they're in trouble. right? Woe to them. So people talk about this a lot, but I mean, the, these guys could be thinking as lawyers, they could be thinking, well, is Jesus saying that all of the sentences that, you know, are hanging over us or whomever for killing prophets and everything need to be executed according to the Bible? Or since God is a just God and the, all of the justice is out of whack here, there's all different gradations of guilt here too. People who killed one or several prophets, people who sort of didn't do anything about it. You know, there's all kinds of guilt, levels of guilt. If God is just, it all has to be evened out somehow to produce a just outcome under the laws of God. But how does that work? That's, you need a supercomputer almost to figure that, to, to, to figure that out, how you do that. Or is it some kind of repentance atonement thing like they had in the Day of Atonement? that we studied in Leviticus. Or, and, and, and like other voices you hear in the true prophetic word, where God says, if you'll turn back to me, I'll turn back to you and I'll wash your sins as white as snow. And some of that kind of prophetic word, the gospel in the Old Testament, which is, they're going to have to hope so. right? And so what we know as Christians, but it's, it's maybe not even easy for us to apply here, is in this generation, Jesus is going to go to the cross and die as an atonement for the forgiveness of, of all sin. So if they can find Jesus, they're going to be able to answer this problem. The Apostle Paul may be like the perfect example, right? I mean, he's like really one of them. And then later he's the Apostle Paul. And so he crosses from dark to light, from death to life, all because he met Jesus and he understood finally what God was really up to, right? But these guys are blind by it right, right now. They're just guilty, and, and Jesus is trying to help them see that. Because maybe the only way you can save them is by making them understand the amount of guilt that, that they stand under. Anyway, th their burden is huge. And right here, Jesus is speaking to Israel. But I don't think we Gentiles can let the lesson stop at the border of Israel either. I mean, there's enough guilt to go around outside of Israel also, I, I suppose. Okay, almost finished. So then he says to them, "Woe!" He says again to them, "Woe to you, lawyers! For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering." <coughs> so the answer to this question was and is in the wisdom of God sent through the prophets and the, the apostles. You know, the, God's wisdom was out there in his prophetic word and in his Moses' laws, if people would only have taken it you know, the, the, to heart and, and in the right way. But the lawyers who have set themselves up as the experts on how to understand this law, that's what they are by definition, they haven't used this word themselves to enter the kingdom of God. Proof of this is the fact that they can't recognize Jesus as their Messiah and their Savior and their Lord, but can see in him only an enemy that needs to be killed. They, they perceive Jesus as, as an enemy, a lot of them. You know. uh, and so clearly they can't recognize the key, the key to the kingdom that they've had in the law and, and finally in, in, in Jesus. But what's worse is because they haven't used it in their own right to, to find the way. They haven't been leading other people there either. They, they might not know how and they have no inclination to. And so because they've squandered the word of God, they've hindered the other people who were entering. And, and, and there is enough word of God out there that a lot of people have probably found salvation in God in one way or another. But these 
teachers of the law are actively going around misteaching the word and trying to, 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 to cut it off because they're saying, no, no, here's the right teaching of the, of the word. God doesn't just love you. He doesn't just love mercy instead of sacrifice. Loving people and giving of your wealth and loving God isn't enough. You have to tithe, you know, your mint and all of this other stuff and wash your cups and whatever it is that they do to, to take people away from God. They're, they're actually taking the keys of the kingdom away from people by teaching, the, you know, the wrong way. Right, so that really focuses the... The, the problem. And so, after this really scathing, I mean, this is really one of the most scathing lessons anywhere in the Bible that Jesus teaches against these scribes and Pharisees. It's scary, scary stuff. As he goes away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees begin to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things. I think that the underlying vocabulary and grammar is saying they're trying to lure him into debate because that's how they process something like this you know the, the the rabbis spend countless hours with the the word open arguing amongst themselves about how shall we understand this and that and then blah 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 they want to pull jesus into that and off of this this point that he's just just made <coughs> and at the same time try to provoke him to speak a lot because they're looking for things that they can find jesus to say that will let them catch him in something he might say so that they could bring charges against him for blasphemy or whatever, as indeed they will do. Um, finally, they'll, they'll do that. And that's, it'll end up with Jesus, Jesus on the cross. So they will have completed the pattern. When they kill Jesus, they'll be at the high point of prophet killing. I mean, there's nothing worse than killing Jesus. And they'll, they'll do that. And yet... The pattern will continue through St. Stephen and um, you know, certain of the disciples and New Testament prophets. You know, it'll, the, the persecution by Jews of Christians will continue for, for a while. <coughs> and so we're done for tonight, but I, I, I would just point you towards the first two or three verses of next week's reading because it kind of is connected. Jesus says at the beginning of chapter 12, says, in the meantime, while they were trying to lure him in, in the meantime, many thousands of people had gathered together and they were trampling one another you know, to get to Jesus. And then Jesus began to say to his disciples first, which, which I admit that's the first thing he said to them, or he said it first to his disciples, it's not clear. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So all three of the synoptic Gospels refer to the leaven of the Pharisees. But only Luke designates clearly that the leaven of the Pharisees, he has in mind at least, is hypocrisy. Which means that they, 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 they look one way that is lawful and holy, devoted to the prophets and to the law, and to pious behavior, but they are another way, which is wicked and, and rotten in, in, inside. And when he tells his disciples to be aware of the leaven, you know, leaven is like bread dough that, that carries over to another bunch of bread dough. So you, you got to stay away from those guys because they will contaminate my church <coughs> if you're not careful. The leaven of the Pharisees is everywhere, you know, in every church, I guess. It may be that the number of things that God actually cares about is really quite small. Love of God and love of man. And if we start multiplying too much beyond that, the, the risk of creating our own religion that leads people astray gets bigger and bigger, I guess. Does anybody want to say something before we pray? If not, let's pray. Uh, dear God, uh, we confess you know, that we are often 
guilty of the same sorts of things that Jesus is pointing to in the uh, the Pharisees and the lawyers in tonight's reading. Um, it's probably not that they're worse than, than we are. They may indeed be, be better. But the problem, I think, you know, from reading this story that they have, at least at the time that we read about, is that they don't know Jesus yet. And they don't know the sort of power of salvation that's available through Jesus' blood, which is the only thing big enough to counter the, the debt that, that they had for the way that the prophets had been handled you know, in, in, in olden times and were still being handled in Jesus' time. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that you have done such a surprising and amazing thing to send your son Jesus to atone for sin, for anyone, for any sin, and for anyone who is willing to put their faith in Christ and ask for forgiveness in, in his name. We pray that everyone, who, however bad their, their sin is, including each of us, um, can, can be forgiven. Lord, please forgive us. And, uh, and please make us aware enough of the things that we do wrong, but also um, of, of the, the great love and mercy and, and salvation which has been available from you since the time of the Old Testament prophets and made you know, manifest perfectly when, when the time came for Jesus. Um, so please um, keep bringing us back to you for forgiveness and help us never to be the leaven of the Pharisees or to be infected by the leaven of the Pharisees, starting to think that there's something about us, our religious practice, or something you know which is actually important. Um, we should understand that the only important thing is to love God and to be filled with your spirit and to, to love and in a sac sac self-sacrificial way to love <coughs> the poor and the needy in the world and other people who, who need us. Please keep these simple lessons coming back to us. And uh, we thank you for, for everything, God. Please help everybody to get home safely tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.